Okay. All right. Um, so firstly, we'll have a bit of time, hopefully, at the end of the session for questions. So if you have some, for those who are watching, if you would like to send me your questions by email, that would be great. If you're on the line and video conferencing in, if you could just mute your speakers, that would be great. Um, for your, the members of your team that are not able to attend today, the webinar will be available after the session with our fun technical difficulties included at the start. Um, we will be sending out an evaluation survey afterwards, and your input is greatly appreciated. It helps us to really frame uh, the sessions and events so that they really cater to your needs and your patients' needs. Um, I'm also thrilled to announce that our, we're well underway with our planning for the annual Professional Development Day. Uh, which will be taking place on Friday, March 4th, 2016. We have a very exciting keynote speaker who will be joining us. And for those who are part of the planning committee, if you can keep it a secret for just a little bit longer, um, I'd like it to be a surprise for everybody. Uh, so that'll be uh, a save the date will be set circulated in the coming weeks. Lastly, I just wanted to mention uh, PCMCH. Uh, I'm just going to switch the slides. So uh, a lot of you have not maybe have heard of the Provincial Council for Maternal and Child Health and Perhaps a lot of you have not, and we're working on that. Um, we are a provincial organization that aims to foster the best possible beginning for lifelong health and improve the delivery of care for maternal and child health patients. Uh, we do so by bringing together and collaborating with people like you, uh, clinical and administrative leaders within the field, uh, to identify priorities, areas of improvement, and gaps in service. Uh, to learn more about what we do and the excited initiatives underway, please feel free to visit us at our website, which is uh, broadcasted on the slides here, or follow us on Twitter. We've been pretty active lately, so uh, we'd love to connect with you. And now I'd like to introduce our two speakers for today. We have Dr. Antonio Pignatello. Sure. <laughs> Dr. Dr. P. Is that okay? Sure. Tony. Tony. Um, Tony, okay. And uh, David Willis. Dr. Pignatello is an associ the Associate Psychiatri Psychiatrist in, in Chief and Medical Director of the Telelink Mental Health Program at the Hospital for Sick Children. And he's also an Associate Professor with the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. David Willis, who's joined beside me, is the Manager of Outpatient Psychiatry, Telemedicine, Telelink Me Mental Health Program, and the Ontario Child and Youth Telepsychiatry Program. Did I get that right? Perfect. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you so much to you both for joining us today, and the floor is now yours. Okay. I'll switch to Great. your slides. Can you put back to the yep. what we'll be covering today first? Sure. Thanks. So, so thanks for inviting us to come in um, and, and address the group. Um, so, what we're going to do today is give a bit of an overview of what's what we call the Telelink Mental Health Program here at Sick Kids, and to understand its current state, it'll be helpful to understand how it started and how it evolved. Um, over time, we're going to talk a little bit about the various components of the program um, and then uh, spend some time in, on uh, how to actually access the program. So, next. so you see different versions of, of this uh, of this little cartoon all over the place. Although it says something went terribly wrong, I think from a telelink perspective, we might say that something went terribly right. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so background and how we started, um, you'll, you'll find the names all start to blur into each other and all start to sound the same um, after a little while. There's, there's only so many variations on Tele that you can use um, to, to keep things distinct. But if we look at the, the concept of Tele as, a, as, as applied to telepsychiatry, it basically can be, it refers to the use of of electronic devices to deliver psychiatric services from from a distance. So as you can apply it to telemedicine or teledermatology or whatever. So the tele implies the distance and um, and 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 then there's an implication of technology in there as well. So the way that our particular program started off, if we go back to 1997, which is a little a few years ago, and it started off as a small pilot project, and it was initiated by a uh, children's mental health agency in, um, uh, in I guess it was in North Bay at the time, I think they were called Algonquin um, Child and Family at the time, who approached some folks with sick kids to see but using what was then this new technology, video conferencing, to try to address some of the gaps in, in services for kids and families um, in rural and remote parts of the, of the province. So that pilot was, uh, was very successful and that then led to the um, 
an RFP, which was put out by a couple of different ministries at the time. It was pre-MC, Ministry of Children's Services days, so it was, uh, I think it was MCSS um, and others. And and, and, and Sick Kids, um, having been involved with the pilot, then was the successful um, recipient of the, of the next phase of implementation. So it takes us to 2000. And at that time, it was called the Telepsychiatry Program. And, and it was a contract that existed between Sick Kids Hospital and the Division of Child um, Psychiatry at the University of Toronto and, and funded by the Ministry of Children and Youth Services. And that was the beginning stages of this program really being implemented. And that continued that way for about six years. There's a slight shift after that, that um, there need to be a, a simplification of the, the contract. And so it was a contract between Sick Kids Hospital and the uh, Ministry of Children and Youth Services. So as that program became more integrated and um, we were doing evaluations on the program, it was certainly found to be um, user-friendly, helpful, and, um, and, and, and worth expanding. In 2007, we'll call it an expansion happened. And what that expansion meant was that same program, same model, uh, only instead of just being delivered out of sick kids, was now going to be delivered out of uh, London and Ottawa as well. And, um, and when that happened, the program name changed. So it was no longer the telepsychiatry program. It then became the Ministry of Children and Youth Services Ontario Child and Youth Telepsychiatry Program. And the way that the program had been set up, it was that each of, there's three hubs that deliver the, the service. Each of those hubs were designated specific children's mental health agencies that we were to provide service to. And those agencies were designated by MCY, uh, MCYS. And uh, so, for example, in Toronto, we had um, 15 sites designated uh, to us. London and Ottawa each had five sites um, designated to them. And, and the service that we could provide was only to those agencies. There was a little bit of opportunity to provide service to other agencies, but it, it can only be to those agencies. And also, since the beginning, um, areas that were excluded were actually the, the Greater Toronto Area and uh, and, and Ottawa and, uh, and and London. So, if if folks were in the in the city, they could not actually access the programs, and we had to provide the service to the specific agencies at the time. And so, at that time, too, the terminology came about that Sick Kids became the central hub, basically serving Central Ontario. Um, Geo became the eastern hub, and, and CPR became the western hub. So that was the expansion, 2007, when, and this is called the Ontario Child and Youth Telepsychiatry Program. So that went on for a couple of years, and one of the things that was happening from a sick kid's perspective, and um, others as well, that we were getting a lot of requests for services that would actually fall outside the scope of the Ontario Child and Youth Telepsychiatry Program. And, um, and, and to respond to, to those needs and those requests, we, we reorganized what we did from the, from the sick kid's perspective, and that led to the creation of the Telelink Mental Health Program, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in, in a little bit. So within the Telelink Mental Health Program, this is a Sick Kids Program, and, and this is a, a, a broader um, umbrella term to, to refer to all the, the telepsychiatry types of programs that we deliver. And within the Telelink Program, we still operate as the central hub for the Ontario Child and Youth Telepsychiatry Program. So I don't know if that's clear or confusing, but it's uh, um, hopefully it'll become clear as we go along. So that's the way that that continued then for a couple of years. Um, and then uh, with the review of the Ontario Child and Youth Telepsychiatry Program from, the, from MCYS, um, there was again another um, an, another iteration or, or reincarnation of what used to be the Ontario Child and Youth Telepsychiatry Program. And in about 2014, we really launched um, and it, what used to be OCYTP is now called the Ministry of Children and Youth Services, Telemental Health Services. So that's the current state. So there's this thing called Telemental Health Services. Okay, and so that is a service that is funded by the Ministry of Children and Youth Services. And that's that Telemental Health Services, that's what that refers to. So my Telelink refers to um, the program is delivered at Sick Kids. A couple of key things shifted in 2014 with the mental health services. So whereas I, I said before that three hubs each were assigned specific children's mental health agencies that we were to provide service to, 
With telemental health services, the concept of uh, designated um, agencies to hubs disappeared. So the referral base expanded, so referrals can come from any, through any children's mental health agency, also now through schools um, and through other mental health service providers. Um, but there is an additional step added. And so to access the services at the hubs, MCYS introduced what are called coordination agencies. And much like uh, moving on mental health introduced the concept of lead agencies across, uh, across Ontario, there are now six coordination agencies that refer specifically to accessing telemental health services. And those three, uh, those six agencies are divided into what are called coordination agencies. And oh, much like yeah. mental health introduced the concept of lead agencies. We're getting some feedback. Yeah. I will be right back. Okay. We'll so I'm just going to keep talking. Yes. I don't really want to hear myself twice, but... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Um, so key thing here is that there are now six coordination agencies, three Aboriginal, three non-Aboriginal. We'll give you the specific information on those. And to access the specialists at the three hubs, a referral has to go through one of the coordination agencies. And, uh, and then once that goes through, um, that information gets passed on to Sick Kids, who is now designated as the single point of triage for all the hubs. Okay. Um, and again, we'll give you specifics on that as we go along. One of the things that made this possible is, is changes are in, in technologies and new things becoming available. So with PCVC or desktop um, access and a variety of other ways of connecting, a number of years ago, as we started to take that up more and more, it became clearer that the service provider could be anywhere. They could be in their homes, which some of our guys are. They could be somewhere else. So, so the concept of having a, an actual a hub where people have to go to to provide the service, that's shifting as well. So it's the technology that also then drove the shift in, in, in the program. So next slide. So as I said, Telelink, it's a sick kids program. And it's an umbrella term to encompass a variety of different initiatives, which we'll, we'll show you in a little bit. Um, and it was our way of responding to, to service uh, gaps as we were meeting needs and requests that we were getting. It um, really allowed us to provide different services that would go beyond the MCYS mandate because the MCYS mandate still says we can't provide service in the Toronto, London, or Ottawa areas, and we can't provide psychology service. There are certain things that we still can't provide. So by creation of something called Telelink, then we can uh, try to meet some of those needs in, uh, through a variety of means, which again, we'll, we'll talk about in, the, in, a, in a little bit. It will allow us to further increase the routes of referral, um, diversity and, and model of service uh, delivery, and, um, and, and also, uh, also contributes to a diversity of uh, income sources. Um, and it gives us more autonomy to work with partners or people interested in accessing services to design something that works for them. So, so just briefly, our vision is, this is Telelink now, Innovation in Child and Youth Mental Health, Enhancing Communities of Care. The key thing there is that we are not primary care providers, so our role is to support primary care providers so that the care stays in the community where the kids and families are. And we define primary care providers very, very generally. It's not just physicians. It can be school social workers. It can be child and youth workers. Anybody who um, assumes the, the primary care, especially mental health care of kids um, and, and the context of families. And um, predominantly our service is, is video conferencing based, We're exploring other technologies. But the type of service that we provide is, is largely video conferencing, um, different ways to connect with through the, uh, uh, with a video conference, but, uh, um, and as I mentioned, we're not primary care providers, but the goal is to enhance care and community capacity. So again, so we really want to prevent the, the travel or the distance of uh, kids and families coming many hours um, to access services. And we have a number of, of ways that we provide that service, and it, there's a, you can break it down, it's basically clinical um, and education and everything that we do is evaluated and we've done a variety of types of research on the different limbs and, um, and components of what we've done. I'm not going to go into that today. Um, basically our guiding principles are that we really want to match the community needs so our intent is not to impose ourselves into a community. We respond to a need and we want to try to match 
the need uh, using what we, you know, evidence that we know of things that work and, and are successful. We really emphasize partnerships and relationship building, um, and we really, really need to pay attention to local um, and, and unique cultures. and. Um, and, and we do take that very, very seriously. So when we are looking to build relationships and work with communities, um, we do very much try to uh, have a very open dialogue with what's needed and as the programs go along to um, make sure that we, we self-correct as, uh, uh, as needed. Okay. Next one. This slide takes about five minutes to finish off. That's kind of interesting. This is David created this slide, which links flight patterns. Um, <laughs> at one time, at, at one time, it was actually a little bit more meaningful a few years ago in the sense that we only had certain communities that we provided service to. This is, in, in actually, positively, this is an antiquated slide in the sense that we can access any community um, in Ontario, and we have other contracts into uh, Nunavut as, um, as well. Um, so. I'm not sure if it's done yet. We can push the next. Uh, okay, et cetera. Et cetera. So basically, we're everywhere, and that also changed over time as more communities actually had access to the technologies. Back in 1997 and 2000, um, the technology availability only, still only really went up about halfway up the province, and so still some communities further north still would have had to travel seven or eight hours to get down to where the technology is. Um, that's no longer the case. Pretty well, every hospital has access to the technology is more home-based um, system, so the technology is, is, is much more of an enabler, not at all a limiting factor. So we can stay on that one. So what we do, so what we offer, we, direct, we offer direct clinical consultations. So basically, um, a, a young person is connected with a primary care provider. The primary care provider makes a referral because they want the young person seen for an opinion around something. So we set up a, um, a consultation, a, a specialist, a, almost always a psychiatrist or psychologist is there, does the consultations, but an hour, an hour and a half in, in, uh, on average. Recommendations are given specific to that particular client, um, and then the primary care provider um, is responsible for doing something with those recommendations, either you know, finding the service that, that's appropriate or advocating for, for the service. Uh, but they're the ones who receive the recommendations and then, and then do something um, with, work with the family to, to do something with those recommendations. And I just emphasize we're consultants, so again, we, we don't, we, we, while we do provide ongoing consultations as needed for cases, especially those that are a bit more complicated, um, we, we do leave it up to the primary care provider to coordinate all the local care. We don't prescribe medications, although we most of the time make recommendations around medication. So now there is, it, it, we could, it's not impossible to prescribe medications. It's more a function of the model of service delivery that we offer that we don't because, again, it's about supporting primary care, and so we will give direction and support around medication prescription. Um, and also because we're not there on, on site, it, it becomes a little more difficult to monitor medications as if you're the primary prescriber if you're at a distance. Um, the concept of program consultations came up a number of years ago, and this is, I think I have another slide that talks a bit more about that. Professional pro to professional consultations, this is kind of like a, a, a direct consultation um, around a specific case, only that the child and family are not there. So it would be professionals working with, with the child and family would set up, um, make a referral for a discussion around that particular, um, that, that particular situation. Next one. A large part of what we do is education. We look at education in a number of ways. Uh, we do a lot of professional development of mental health providers at, at distant sites. Um, uh, we do many of those. Um, we do those through sick kids and also through the telemental health services. There's a central um, education uh, program organized through the Center of Excellence at, uh, at CHEO that, uh, that does on a provincial level a um, um, variety of, of training sessions that are, are based on needs assessments that have been done periodically. We are a teaching center, so we have a variety of trainees, psychiatry and others that come and participate with us. And at Sick Kids and the other hubs as well, we have weekly mental health grand rounds that uh, happen every Thursday between 11 and 12. And we have a number of communities that link in um, either by a video conference or, or webcast, and um, much like we're, we're doing here today. So just next one. So this is just some idea of the numbers of patients that we've seen and services that we provided. So since about 2000, we've done about, about 20,000 um, clinical services, about 1,500 program consultations, uh, professional development services, uh, definitely over 600. Over, uh, reached over 8,000 participants. 
um, number of students that have participated. Our consultants are predominantly psych child and adolescent psychiatrists, almost all with an academic affiliation. There's about, if you look at the three hubs, there's about 40 in total on the roster, which is certainly the largest number of child psychiatrists in any one um, situation, um, probably, I'm not sure, worldwide, but, but, but close. Um, there's certainly some countries that don't have a single child psychiatrist. So to have 40 or so available um, is, uh, it, it certainly adds a lot of opportunities to meet a, a variety of needs. Um, and the service agreements and contracts, uh, David's going to talk about that in a little bit. So just a snapshot, what gets referred to us, who gets referred to us. Most of the referrals that come to us are around met management and medication questions. Um, and so if you think within the context of diabetes, for example, so a, a child may have diabetes, but the reason you would refer to a psychiatrist or mental health specialist would be because there's either a, a behavior problem or a mood problem and, and may or may not be associated or related to, to the diabetes. There may be some medication that might be um, of, of help. Um, to address the mood of the behavior problem. A lot of kids referred for behavior problems. Um, and as you can see, this next slide. So in terms of, this changes year to year, but on average, the, the, the kind of diagnoses of the kids that we see tend to be, as I said, most largely behavioral problems. So attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, oppositional behaviors, a lot of kids with anxiety, uh, a lot of kids with learning disabilities. And uh, I think in this particular year, Autism spectrum disorder didn't make it in the top 10, but we see a lot of kids with developmental delays and, and autism, not so much, not for the purposes of diagnosing specifically, but more to address the behavior um, or emotional um, concurrent issues that, that may go along with that. Next. We rank all our consultations in terms of degree of severity. We're shifting a little bit to, to the MCYS uh, 1 to 4 scale. But in general, year after year, most of the cases that we see, we would rank as a moderate severity with um, an even distribution at both ends on the mild and, and severe. Okay, next. Um, I, so just, you can leave this slide on, but just, we, we do see um, a fair number of cases with an incredible degree of complexity um, and certainly high risk cases and the way that we operate, we don't actually see anything as an absolute contraindication to us seeing a young person. In, um, I believe it's still the case, in, in Quebec they have um, psychosis as a, an absolute contraindication to referral by video conference. Um, we don't have that as anything, it's a relative contraindication. We have seen kids who are actively psychotic um, and with certainly appropriate support um, on site and, and, and preparation, it, um, we, we, we can, those kids can do just fine. There's really been only a handful of kids that have not been able to tolerate the, uh, the video conferencing. I got 20,000, probably about a, a dozen um, at, at our end. So um, again, the, the, the degree of complexity is probably even greater than in some um, outpatient, uh, outpatient clinics. We also have specialists in medical psychiatry, and so if there is a referral for a young person, where there's a medical issue and, and a combined mental health issue, so obviously diabetes would fall in that category. We do have consultants who um, work with med in medical psychiatry, consultation liaison psychiatry, and we would tend to triage those kinds of referrals to, um, to, to those specialists. We make a variety of recommendations, really no different than the types of recommendations that would come up in a general uh, mental health assessment, uh, so recommendations for further assessment, um, certain types of therapies and, uh, and other types of recommendations. Um, and about, I think, 60% of the time we make some kind of recommendations related to medications. And it may be specific things like increase or decrease the dose, but sometimes the recommendations very specifically don't add medication. So we, we, do, um, we do address those questions. Okay. And then I think it's my last slide, then I'll hand it over to David. So I want to talk a little bit about program consultations. This is something that um, it's been described for years um, in, in consultation uh, books and stuff, but initially was not part of the, of the program. So program consultation is a situation where there is a consistent, um, there's consistent team members from a particular program in an agency or school or, or wherever, and they would meet on a monthly basis with a consistent um, specialist or consultant. And, and, and those meetings last about uh, an hour and a half, which we find is, the, is, is a reasonable um, length of time. We can connect with one site at a time or many sites. 
um, at a time. And and we don't talk about cases, they're not cases referred specifically like in the professionals or professional, but there might be an anonymous case presentation, which brings about issues uh, such as uh, behavioral issues or formulation or management issues or program issues um, or um, things related to, to the service providers themselves and their, their feelings, their approaches to the, um, to the kids and, and youth. And those so those sessions are a combination of uh, supportive group psychotherapy, educational um, models, and uh, we've been initially again we started with well none, um, and then the concept uh, developed and grew to the point that we're doing about thirty of these on a monthly basis. The um, we have just done uh, a year's worth of collection of, of information and, and research and evaluation into this particular modality, and we're just. Um, collating all that information and feeding back. So we're certainly learning that some situations do better than others. We're also seeing that there's a bit of a, a finite lifespan for some of these program consultations, just trying to get a sense of what is that. Is it a year, five years, or, or so on? It's fascinating. I don't know how many people have heard of the ECHO, um, ECHO model, um, which is a specific model. It, it, it's video conferencing technology-based. Um, train the, the trainer um, uh, capacity building program that is applied specifically to either pain management or mental health um, coming out of um, New Mexico. And what I like to say is I think we were, we were way before ECHO with our program consultations. We just didn't have the foresight to brand it as something um, and, and sell it as something. So, um, so ECHO's kind of beat us, just wait. So if you look at the model, it's actually very similar. Um, only ECHO in the adult, mostly geared towards adult uh, service providers, more towards the, uh, the physician um, and the physician environment. Um, and we actually are participating in, um, in an ECHO um, model that um, uh, is being done through the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. So the, we're providing the, the child component of that. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to David. Okay, I'm just going to take a quick second to just mention a couple of things. We've mu muted those on the line, uh, and we I have access to my email, so if you're still having issues, feel free to send me an email, and I will try my best to mitigate. Um, Echo, I was just going to say, has a really great site and some great videos. Not to, but um, we have a video too. Ours is just because we were still yeah, ahead yeah. of them. Ours is now old compared oh. to what Echo does, but well, it's still a really good video. But we look much younger in our video. Oh well, if you want me to circulate it to the network, we can certainly do that. All right, I'll hand it over to David. Great. So. Thanks. Um, when we talk about uh, telelink mental health, and, and Tony sort of broke down uh, the different areas that, that we provide service, I, I think that it was probably, if we're going to talk about the kinds of services that we provide, it's easier to put them into buckets. Um, so we, we divided, or I divided what we do into four distinct buckets, and the first one being telemental health service. Uh, and that's, of course, what, what Tony was speaking to, our, our uh, partnership with the Ministry of Child News Services and providing uh, the three types of services across the province to mental health agencies uh, and other mental health providers. Uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, the, uh, the other bucket, or another bucket, is telepsychology, and that's kind of a new um, way of doing business in terms of psychology. We, we haven't yet found anyone else doing exactly what we're doing. And that, uh, it started with a partnership with a children's mental health agency in the far north who really didn't have psychological services uh, available for their kids. And so what we ended up doing, in, instead of um, thinking about straight treatment, we actually thought about the assessment services that take place in, in psychology. So we partnered with an agency that have um, psychometrists at the, at the far site or the, the northern site. And what we do is we provide education and training and assessment services to kids all over video. So to date, we've seen uh, somewhere around 250 different kids uh, for full assessment. It's a two-day-a-week program at this point. Uh, we partner with just one agency, but uh, there's lots of interest in it, and it's a, it's a new and exciting way to actually provide psychology services to areas that simply don't get um, psychology services locally, or they, uh, they contract out for psychology services, and, uh, and the cost differentiation between the two is, is uh, fairly large. Um, the, next, the next area that we, uh, we provide service to is family physicians, and we call it the Family Physician Program. And that was provided, uh, or that was started through um, some funding that was provided by uh, our local Lynn, 
who recognized the fact that uh, that physicians didn't have access to psych services through the uh, the other channels that uh, tele telemental health provide. So they gave us a little bit of funding and we opened up, um, put a shingle out and started providing services to physicians across the province who have uh, patients that need to have uh, psych services and that uh, the first year was a bit of a it was a bit of a startup process, and it quickly filled to capacity, and it remained at capacity. Uh, in fact, if we could double it, we would. Uh, so we're we're working towards increasing that. Uh, there's a real need for family physicians to have access to psych services uh, in a in a direct and a quick way, and this uh, this seems to be a model that's actually working quite well. And the other bucket that we created is really called service agreement, and and. There are specific organizations or programs across the province who simply, like physicians, um, didn't have access to services. And, and because we're blessed with capacity, we were able to sort of, we were able to meet with these organizations and help them uh, in designing programs that provide the services where they need them. So a couple examples of those would be uh, inpatient mental health beds in hospitals. So there are several several hospitals across the north that when a, when a, a child or youth is uh, admitted to the eMERGE um, on a form, uh, which means they're basically uh, there's worry that they may cause harm to themselves or someone else. We get the call, and within 72 hours, we actually provide the psych assessment and the follow up and the report to the to the physician uh, and the patient in the hospital. And uh, we've been doing that for four or five years now, and it uh, it just gets busier and busier. Another good example of the service agreements is uh, boards of ed. So there are several uh, school boards across the province that we now partner with to provide um, not as much the clinical service, but more the capacity building. The tele, the uh, the program consultation model is big, and the education series are big with them as well. And that's geared towards uh, teachers, administrators, principals, and uh, and the mental health uh, component of the of the school boards. Let's look to the next one. So I thought that I would talk a little bit about the referral process for each of these. It, um, it varies slightly, but uh, it's all centralized in terms of our program. We have a, we have a very um, efficient and, uh, and uh, hardworking intake team who manage all the different buckets that, that we uh, provide uh, into one stream for intake. So if we look at the service agreements, really it's the partnering organizations. They have a direct line to our intake coordinator. Um, when, when they get a patient in that needs our services, we get the call and we, uh, we provide that within the time frame that's needed. Uh, in terms of the family physician program, it, uh, it started off a bit different. Physicians, uh, for those of you that work a lot with them, are often um, tricky to engage. So the idea of having a case manager sitting at the far end for a patient uh, became a bit of a, a tricky point for us. So we've worked very hard to, to come up with solutions that allow for patients to be seen by our physicians uh, and have physicians uh, be an active part of that or have someone that's representing that physician be an active part of the, the consultation. So oftentimes we'll have a physician who will call us and really sort of drop the case into our lap and say, I don't know what to do with this client. Can you suggest something? And we, uh, we then triage it to the most appropriate psychiatrist. Um, the telemental health service, that model uh, works through the coordinating agency that Tony spoke to. Um, the Youth Justice Program, which is also sitting in that uh, in the telemental health service or the MCYS area, is um, is a program that uh, provides services to young offender facilities across the province, and it uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, we actually work individually with uh, with each of the facilities to figure out what it is that they need in terms of services and how we can tailor what it is that we provide to match the uh, the services that they uh, that they are looking for uh, and again it's the same sort of triage process and then the telepsych psychology service agreement that one is um, that one comes through one individual agency in the far north and the and the the clients are brought into the agency. There's a process that they go through at the local level to identify the, the clients who would be appropriate for telepsychology, and then there's an intake process that takes place with the psychologist and the intake coordinator to determine whether or not those, uh, those patients are suitable for the program. There we go.
six coordinating. You want me to do the six coordinating? So, sure, sure. so when we talked about the telemental health service, there are six coordinating agencies that were set up in the last two years to manage the flow of referrals uh, across the entire province. There are three agencies that service uh, First Nations and Aboriginal uh, communities and organizations, and there are three agencies who um, service the rest of the general population. Um, for the general population, the province is divided into three. Uh, and the agencies that, that provide the services are HANS, which is located in North Bay. And if you can see or if you can't see, um, the service areas are quite large. So they go everywhere from Dundas, Glengarry, up to Halliburton, Muskoka, Perry Sound area. Um, and the contact information is there. And if you don't have it on your screen, we can certainly get that contact information mm -hmm. to you. The next agency is Woodview, and that's, um, that's down in the southwest of Ontario. Uh, sort of Norfolk, Brant, Haldeman, Chatham, Kent, uh, and all the way up into the Gray Bruce area. And then the last one is uh, Algoma Family Services, and they really service everything from Sault Ste. Marie all the way up to Hudson's Bay and then over to the um, Manitoba, Alberta, or sorry, Manitoba, Ontario border. And then the Aboriginal First Nations population, their, um, their catchments are similar, but, uh, but not quite. So the coordinating agency for Southern Ontario, and that catchment actually spreads from the Quebec border over to Windsor and then up into the Perry Sound area. That's uh, the Southern Ontario Aboriginal Health Access Center, and their main location is out of Hamilton, Ontario. Um, Delico Anishinaabek is located in Thunder Bay. That's the next one. And they, they, um, they service the Manitoulin, and Sudbury, Greater Sudbury, that area, all the way up to uh, Thunder Bay. And then the last one is Wichitawin, which is in Fort Francis. And they, uh, they serve that enormous section from, again, Hudson's Bay all the way over to the Manitoba, Ontario border. And those are the, those are, you know, these, these six coordinating agencies are the main um, referral uh, access route for children and youth in the province through the telemental health program. So let's talk a little bit about how, if organizations are interested in building a service agreement. We, uh, we spent quite a bit of time on this, and, and we wanted to make it as easy as possible for organizations to actually um, work with us to build these things. And, and as organization to organization, we have to have some sort of contractual process in place that covers us for all the things that contracts cover. Uh, and the legal and, and uh, communications folks, I guess, would know all about that. So to start that process off, we just meet with the, um, with the agency and understand what the needs are, or try to understand what the needs are uh, within the organization and uh, determine whether or not there's a natural fit between that organization and, uh, and Telelink. Uh, the next part of that is developing a framework for services, um, you know, assessment, capacity, enhancement, education, all of those services are, um, are uh, up for, uh, for consideration in these service agreements. So what we did was we, we made it very simple for, for organizations and literally we provide them with uh, what looks like a calculator and we've, we've developed a costing model that, um, that applies per service. So if you're, if you're a school board uh, in the Northwest Ontario and you think that you're going to need 50 clinical consultations, two education sessions, and five program consultations, you can punch that into our calculator and it will provide you a snapshot of what, what, the, the, uh, what the cost will be for that. Um, once the, uh, once the, the organization has established really what their needs are, then we move to the, the service agreement uh, draft process, and that, uh, that outlines all the services agreed and the compensation. Uh, and then finally, of course, the service agreement is signed by both organizations. And, uh, and as a part of that, we look at the technology as well, which I didn't actually include up here, but you know, to ensure that there is, a, there is a connection between the organization that's secure and provided by OTN or some other uh, technology provider that links with OTN and, uh, and us. Mm. Great, thanks. And uh, at the end there is the contact info. Yeah. So back to you. No, that was it. That's it. <laughs> that was Great. it. Question and answer. So I want to leave lots of time for questions. Yes, if we have, have them. 15 minutes left, which is fantastic. Thank you both for a great uh, overview. And we can circulate the slides afterwards as yep. a PDF. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the webinar itself will be 
uh, accessible afterwards. So for all the members who want to rewind back and understand all the acronyms, you're making me feel better about PCMCH. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, this, is, this is helpful. We so need a book. Yeah, yeah, we need to create a, uh, an acronym book. Um, so we'll move straight to our question period uh, so that we can capitalize the time we have with both you and your expertise. Um, so I also want to introduce Liz Ferguson, who's oh. the director of the uh, Telelink Mental Health Program. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. your employee. No, that's all right. Um, so for those who are on the line and on webinar, uh, Roberto from Telemedicine can, great, I can see the video. So you guys are up on the screen and you'll be unmuted. For those who are watching or listening, if you'd like to send me an email with your questions, I will uh, relay them back to the group. And for those who are in the room and hiding, uh, if you have any questions, maybe we'll start with you. Not to put you on the spot. I'm going to start with a question, maybe. Um, where where do you see this program in two to five years, and how can the PDF, the pediatric diabetes programs, really capitalize and leverage the services available? I know we kind of really focused on that with the presentation, but sure. um, I think that there's been, with the network and a lot of the conversations we've had, the psychosocial care and the access to a psychiatrist has been a really um, cle a clear need for the programs, and uh, we have our um, Ruth in the room who is uh, wonderful, but also not, in, she's only here a certain amount of days at, at the hospital for sick children, um, and so there's a lot of programs who are looking for that sort of support. So maybe it's a two-part question. Sure. So where, where do we see the program going in the next few years? I, I think the program as it exists, will, will, that'll be like a, a staple, that'll be a mainstay of the type of service. I think. You know, we're, we're clearly very integrated into many communities across the province, and many communities I think, will say that they see us as just a, an extension of what they what they offer. This is no longer um, an afterthought. Um, we'll need to keep uh, focused on the different technologies as they as they come out and see what actually makes sense um, to to incorporate and, and build on. There's more and more move toward. Um, connecting with kids and families um, where they are uh, using mobile devices so we need to continue to explore what that might look like. Um, you know, examples of PCVC, it came out, it's going to do all these wonderful things, so we've been testing it out and we're learning that it's, it's good in some situations and not great in other situations. So we, we'll continue to work with the technology as it changes and, and as it emerges, uh, recognizing, you know, too, that we've learned that. Just because the technology is out there doesn't mean that you have to find a use for it. Um, and it should be the other way around. Um, looking more to build on what we have, expand on what we have, um, maybe help other other communities or other providers who, who may want to develop something similar, whether it's not necessarily just within Ontario, but even in internationally, so moving towards that program development um, level. But, but the, the program, as we described, at that we see that that will stay. That will be the the, the, the bread and butter, if you will, of, of what we offer. And then your second question was around how how the programs can really leverage at this point yep. the services available. Yeah. So if you could back a couple slides, uh, we'll, we'll stop. Yeah, I'm next one actually. So there's a number of ways to access all the services that we provide, and it's essentially, if you if you leave psychology um, as a separate limb. So the, the three uh, boxes on the right. So the way to access us, a number of, right, so, so the Child Mental Health Service, that would be through one of those six coordination agencies. So somebody would make a referral through one of those coordination agencies and then, and then it comes on to us. Family physicians, uh, pediatricians can also refer directly. So through a doctor's office, they can refer directly to us. Challenge there is, as David mentioned, our funding is provided by the Toronto Central Lynn, and that's limited. And so, as that part has grown and has become more popular, uh, we unfortunately have actually had to shut down the, the the program or spread out the services over the fiscal year. Um, and and we continue to to lobby and advocate with TC Lynn and other Lynns to increase that funding base so that we can we can continue to meet that need. But in essence. A referral from a physician is another route to go 
uh, to our program. And then, as, as, as David mentioned, if there's a particular program or, or facility that has their own specific unique needs and, and they want their own direct access and they want a program tailor-made and custom-made to what they want, then we would begin a discussion to work towards a contract or a service agreement and then we would provide that service that, that's agreed upon. Just as a side, we always get asked this question. So if the referral is through MCYS Telemental Health Services, through the coordination agency, there is no fee associated with that. If it's through a physician's office, there also is no fee associated with that. A service agreement, that service agreement then also looks at how much it would actually cost to, if you will, purchase the services that we have to offer. Um, and we, we also have uh, different ways of tapping into the OHIP billing system for physicians as, as well. So essentially right now it's one of those three mm -hmm. routes. And if you have any, any questions or more information, the contact information through the website or through the general, um, general inquiries, we can help direct people through that. Great. I think I just wanted to add to that. I think in, in terms of where we're going in the next three to five to ten years, I think part of it is the urban um, yeah. conversation that's that's going to happen. I think that the, the Toronto Centre alone certainly has a strategy to expand psychi psychiatry services through telepsychiatry into urban areas, um, and I think the technology is flattening out. Right. So I think that you know we've got these we've got these silos built across the province for access. And I think as, as the telemental health service grows for, through MCYS, that referral base will continue to expand. I think the, the fact that technology is becoming cheaper and it's becoming easier to use means that more people can actually have it within their organization. And so that will allow more routes, referral routes into the program. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any questions on the line for those via webinar? I can hear some some sounds coming through. All right, maybe we'll turn it to the room. Is there are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the program you have that's related to Echo, um, and is there any capacity within that program to open it up to the diabetes centers in Ontario, where there is that kind of facilitative support and education for? maybe non-psychiatric or psychology yeah. prepared um, yeah. care providers. Sure. I, I know in our um, diabetes education program, we're often approached by our out outreach mm -hmm. partners to provide support um, either face-to-face, -face, and that is becoming more and more challenging with yeah. the economic mm -hmm. climate. So we're really looking to leverage technology to really try and provide right. that support. So is there a kind of um, capacity to do that within the telelink services. Yeah. So again, subtle but important distinction to make. So through telelink, we we do the program consultation, so similar kind of model. But for act, those are accessed through one of the three routes that we just described. Echo is a specific uh, branded um, branded model, um, and so there is a group out of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health led by um, Alison Crawford and Sanjeev Sakalingam who. Um, so I've put forward a proposal through the Ministry of Health to do a three-year pilot on Project ECHO specifically for mental health in Ontario. So if you want, we can give you their contact information. Um, and I believe they're at the beginning phases of building their um, community um, uh, spokes, if, if you will, so, so the folks who would, who would participate. Okay. I might... So I was just going to say, the other thing is that if you're looking for technology, just like straight technology in order to connect with patients, instead of bringing them into yeah. the hospital, the telemedicine program here at the yeah. hospital can actually manage that for you as well. Yeah, I think it's more really the specialized content right. also that, right. we're, that, right. you know, that, that we're also yeah. yeah. So, uh, so as far as our connection with it, I mean, we know the folks very, very well. We were, we were closely together. Um, and I know they do have a child psychiatrist who, who works with us is, is providing the child um, psychiatry component for their, um, for their group. And may, maybe I can just add as well. So I, I understand that there's also some echo efforts uh, in other realms w yeah. that are being proposed, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. which is fantastic. So uh, the idea from what I understand is echo is like there's a hub and then there's spokes and same, same sort of same idea here. Yeah. Um, and then just on a, on a side note with the network, we are, uh, we do have an initiative underway with outreach linkages. So I think some of the, the concerns or um, requests that you're getting from your outreach program, we are addressing with this, pr with this uh, initiative and looking at, you know, uh, different ways that we can bring people together in, and perhaps 
um, more uh, effective use of technology so that, for instance, all the pediatricians or pediatric endos from sick kids wouldn't necessarily need to travel to Sudbury and cancel clinic to do that. Um, some opportunities for um, capacity building as well as shared care through more technology-based uh, solutions. So we are underway in, in putting forth those recommendations and looking at how we might implement them. Um, and there might be an opportunity to kind of leverage mm -hmm. and partner with um, the Telelink services to, mm -hmm. to support that. Because as, as I, we said at the start, mental health and psychosocial care is really, it comes up in every conversation. Um, and how we support children uh, with diabetes and mental health um, uh, concerns or, or uh, conditions. So I think there's, there's a lot underway, um, but I think this is a really great opportunity for the programs to leverage services that are currently available. Um, so I think we have about three minutes left. So are there any other questions on the line? I will check email. Were there any other questions in the room? No? Um, so we have four minutes left. I wanted to thank you all for joining us in person, uh, for you both to join us and take the time out of your day to present. It's really helpful. I, I've found that trying to navigate the system and what is available with regards to mental health has been challenging for myself, uh, and I'm involved in the healthcare system, so I can. <laughs> it's really great to have kind of an overview, and I think that hopefully the programs as well find it very uh, useful. The slides themselves will be circulated to the group um, for your viewing pleasure uh, and can be shared with your team members. And the plan is to have the webinar accessible uh, via the PCMCH website following the session. Um, so I just want to say a sincere thank you to you both for taking the time. Um, and for the, all those on the line, thank you for joining us. Uh, and so since we have a bit, couple more minutes and those who joined us a little bit late, I'll mention again that mm -hmm. we'll be sending out an evaluation survey. So it would be really great to hear your feedback. This is the first time uh, I've hosted a web webinar uh, as well as through this solution. So any information about the technical difficulties, thank you for your patience at the start. Um, and also to mention that, again, uh, the network uh, annual professional development day will be taking place on Friday, March 4th, 2016, uh, in Toronto, Ontario. And we are really excited. We have a great um, lineup of speakers, and uh, including a really wonderful keynote that I am very, very excited about. Uh, so a save the date will be sent out in the next com couple of weeks. Um, and I think that's it. Did you have any other no. closing remarks? No? All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And have a great afternoon. Bye. <laughs>